Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. Not the Monday edition, not the Friday edition, but the Tuesday edition. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Congo. I'm Gavin Ashenden. You're listening. Oh, dear. Is it, do we do the date now? We do, don't we? <laughs> okay. You're listening on Tuesday, January the 29th, 2019. But they are still listening. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing more important than the date. Yeah. Now, believe it or not, we had a lot of show prep today. Yeah, we, and we're very prepared for the topics we're going to talk about. But before we get to those, we're going to talk about uh, what I call viewer participation, listener participation. And that's where you like the show, you share the show, you comment on the show. If you had not subscribed to the show, be sure to go to YouTube and subscribe to the show. And if you want to not just look at our old geezer faces, you can listen to the show on a podcast. That information is in the show notes. Gentlemen, I see Gavin has rosy cheeks. Tomorrow, George is going to have rosy cheeks. The weather is a changing. It's going to be 60 to below today, uh, wind chill in Chicago. What's going on over there in England, Gavin? Well, I've, I've just come back from spending a week talking at a conference in Greece where all the Greeks were going around in coats and hooded uh, fur-lined hoods, and I was happily enjoying myself in shirt sleeves, and I was very warm and comfortable there. So I've come back to a lot of snow and cold, and I think that's why my it, it's that rather than the pre-lunch sherry that's given me yes, rosy. Right. <laughs> no, we always and have if, a pre-show drink. <laughs> and if we had if we had our friend David Old on, he could show us pictures of the asphalt melting in Australia. <laughs> They're in the midst of an unprecedented heat wave in New South Wales. Mm. All right. Well, the first news we should talk about is the Asia BB update. We talked to you in October when she won the Supreme Court case, allowing her to leave Pakistan. There was an appeal by the <laughs> Islamic State saying, no, she can't leave. Today, she finally won that appeal, and she's allowed to join her children in Canada. Um, however, is she going to make it to the airport is the big question. Uh, she's got a lot going against her, George. The government of Imran Khan, the prim premier of Pakistan, is, doesn't necessarily follow the rulings of the courts. It does what it's in its political interests. Uh, the hardline Islamic groups who Khan relied upon to be elected have called for the reinstatement of the death penalty, and that was their appeal, that uh, a Siabibi's case should be heard not by Pakistani civil law, but by Sharia law. And under Sharia law, she should be executed for blasphemy against uh, the prophet of Islam, Muhammad. Now, the Supreme Court said, no, this is a civil law matter. Therefore, uh, she is free of the civil jurisdiction. That doesn't necessarily mean she may leave the country. It just means that she is no longer under the civil penalty of imminent death. And the question is, can she get out alive? Will the, doc will the state allow her to get out? And does the poor woman really want to go to Canada of all places? <laughs> 40 below. Yeah, I, I see your point. But you posted a story in Anglican Inc. this week that said Pakistan now allows uh, Christian marriages to go forth as uh, civil unions. Yes and no. Not civil unions. Uh, <coughs> under the Raj, the British Empire, Muslim marriages were legal, Christian marriages were legal, Hindu marriages were legal, Sikh marriages were legal. Mm -hmm. Religious ceremonies were recorded by the state as having legal force. It was only, I believe, in 1987 when Pakistan moved, began to move into its hardline Islamic mode uh, that the local the states, uh, like the Punjab, would refuse to register Christian marriages at, um, in the civil registers. And it's taken in a, a legal challenge by the, de the, the, the Dean of Lahore of the Church of Pakistan, the Anglican Church of Pakistan, to say the government should honor what the Constitution of Pakistan says, that Christians and Hindus and Sikhs, as well as Muslims, their religious ceremonies are considered valid in case of marriage. And so, in essence, the Pakistani Supreme Court is saying, yes, we will abide by what our Constitution says question is will state officials still do that 
Well, believe we it or not, the yeah, Pakistan is not our main topic today. Uh, we do read the comments you guys put on YouTube, and I was reading one of the comments that says, why don't you guys ever discuss the comments? And I thought that's a good point. In our pre-show, we discussed it, and Gaffin said, yeah, but we could just get to stuck in discussing comments. Why don't we just reply to the comments? Um, and I think that's a good topic about the whole nature of unscripted. Well, I, 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 I wanted to talk about a different topic. Uh, and no, Gavin has green eyes, not blue eyes. <laughs> but, Evan, but I was overruled. And uh, Kevin, Kevin and Gavin wanted to go into more meteor topics. The media topic. Well, we have a, a large contingent of people who comment on uh, our unscripted episodes. My favorite are the, the, the Roman Catholics until death. We love what you're saying about Pope Francis. You're absolutely right. The church is going down. It's been liberalized. It's been progressive. Uh, it's going to hell. But guys, you guys as reformers have left the church and the faith, and you're going to hell too. And those are a certain contingent uh, of our commenters. What are some of the other commenters you guys have observed? There's some people who say, well, why do we always talk about negative things? We have some new Anglicans who... Uh, it's basically our sort of my country right of wrong. I've put invested myself spiritually and uh, emotionally into this new faith, in this new denomination. And you guys are always being mean. And this goes into a deeper picture, into to a deeper issue of uh, Gavin has been chastised for allowing the, uh, what is it, what was the phrase? Uh, this uh, Speaking with the spirits of the age rather oh, than the spirits uh, no, of the no, gospel. No, no. Co commenting more in the flesh than in the spirit. Yes. I, I, what I took that to mean, but I had because I did have to think about it, and it and it worried me somewhat. Uh, I, I think that applied to me dribbling a bit and fulminating over George Bell. <laughs> I got really cross. Um, so the, I mean, there may be some 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 element of truth in that. I I think perhaps one of the things we should let people know is that uh, we try hard to avoid winning arguments for the sake of arguments or making points for the sake of points or defending our corners for the sake of our corners but what we are really trying to do is to gain a sense prophetically if that's not too ambitious of finding out what the holy spirit is saying to the church in order to allow the church to be the church and george without wanting to to to, to co-complement you as you quite rightly said before the show we look at the book of revelation and and jesus comes with a similar agenda he pats people on the head and in the in the uh seven churches bit and says well you know well done but look there are some real problems with these matter and they need to be addressed so we we could spend more time saying well done but um i i don't think that's what would that achieve in terms of the of the church people wouldn't be listening to us to gain praise from us uh we 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 have no status to bestow praise but on the other hand if the ship is sinking uh, if there's if the if the church needs reforming and renewing uh, if, if it needs reformatting, then we might be able to be of help by saying, look, this is where it's going really badly wrong and this is what might be done about it. So although it sounds quite negative, I think it's no more negative than a surgeon trying to excise a cancer. It might look dramatic, but the purpose is to bring life. Well, I, I, let me expand on what Gavin said in that, you know, I, I mentioned uh, that passage in Revelations where uh, the Spirit speaks to the church in Thyatira, where Attendance is up. Income is up. You guys are doing a great job. You're nice to each other. Oh, but by the way, you're allowing Jezebel to teach and be amongst you, and she's practicing sexual immorality. Mm. Friends, if there's not a greater analogy, perhaps Laodicea, to the Anglican world <laughs> right now, <laughs> which is neither warm nor hot, hot nor cold, I don't know what is. We are a church of Thyatira, where mm. some of us are doing quite well. Some portions are teaching the gospel, preaching the gospel, but Christ uh, reprimands them nonetheless for allowing them, for, for their tolerating the immorality and false teaching amongst them. And I think what we need to let people understand is that we have a straight news outlet, which is Anglican Inc. Uh, unless you want to give us the money so that we can become an Anglican EWTN, where we have our own news broadcast, Anglican Unscripted is a chat show where we share our views and opinions about the news. Yeah. So those things that we bring forward are things that we can talk about. 
uh, in other words, before the show, I was saying, Kevin, do we really need to talk about a C of E? Because it's not really something that not, none of the three of us, I think, are going to propound that she should be executed, that, you know, the Islamic card liners were right. So what do we have to add to this debate? Kevin's point was, oh, we've raised it before. We, it's what? a follow-up to the, the information we were given before. Um, and, you know, sometimes we have shows where we do updates to stories we've done before. And I think, you know, Asia or Ajija, however you want to pronounce her name, was an important update because today the Supreme Court said under no, you know, she is a free person. She's been uh, exonerated of charges. She is free, but that doesn't mean very much in Pakistan. And I, I think George followed up on that story really well. And the other area that we don't go into, in other words, for instance, do you remember at George uh, Herbert Walker Bush's funeral, there was a big furore that Donald Trump did not recite the uh, creed when the other presidents did in the front row. And there was a fury in the press for a few days that that means Donald Trump is not a Christian, he's a hypocrite, or this or that. We did not jump into that story, either condemning or supporting Donald Trump, because that's outside of our brief. We don't do domestic politics. We focus on the life of the, we focus on politics when it's within the life of the church and mm -hmm. politics. I mean, and sadly, George Bell is a political church story. Mm -hmm. What Gavin has shared over the mess, how many years now has this been going on? But what Gavin has shared is that George Bell is a fig leaf for the church needing to be seen to be doing something about the dreadful abuse scandal. And the cheapest, easiest, win-win situation solution was let's sacrifice a bishop dead for 70 years rather than address the Iwern scandal. What did Justin Welby know? When did he know it? How was it that the Archbishop of York happened to lose all these files about this pedophile priest uh, in under his jurisdiction? Oh, there was a flood that year. A flood. And now, so what do we have instead from the Church of England? We have let's pile on the dead bishop. This is a great point for a transition. We have talked at least three or four times the last couple months about culture, the culture of Nigeria, the culture of China, the culture of uh, different countries around the world in, in their response to Christianity. And in our pre-show, we've been talking about the Church of England and the culture within that, uh, in there. And what I discovered in listening to Gavin and listening to George is in a large proportion of the church, nobody cares about the Anglican communion. Nobody cares what goes on beyond their parish, certainly not their diocese, and certainly not the international Anglican communion. I was speaking, uh, I don't want to give away who it was, but to a person of the executive council of the ACNA. And he said Archbishop Foley went over to do his UK GAFCON tour uh, recently to the UK, and he discovered that nobody knew about the ACNA, nobody knew about GAFCON, and certainly nobody knew about GAFCON UK in some of the churches he went to. He had to give the whole story again about GAFCON, the whole story again about the ACNA, because they are so isolated. And Gavin had a good explanation, and one of those was, well, they don't care. Uh, well, can you follow why, I, go well, ahead, well, before we go there, I think we need to say why this is so important. And I think we need... Before we get to the cultural answer, I think we need to lay this against an actual incident to show why this matters. And I think, Gavin, if you would first speak on the what I would call the Ian Paul letter, oh, sure. uh, challenging the Bishop, House of Bishops' advice on transgender baptism, and then why the Kevin's observation that nobody cares about Gafgan UK is so frightening. Um, I think a lot of people may not understand outside England uh, that, that Anglicanism in England and Anglicanism outside England are really rather different things. Um, in fact, I think there are many people in the Church of England who don't even know that there are Anglicans outside England. I don't, that may sound a bit odd, but uh, never in any of my time in parish life or on deanery synods or diocesan synods, and only occasionally on general synod did anyone ever pay attention to the Anglican communion, except when the Archbishop of Canterbury made a fuss about Lambeth Palace and there were some political issues involved. Because paradoxically, the Church of England is a congregationalist outfit. 
There are small communities with a church in the middle and the vicar just gets on with doing uh, either religion or Christianity, depending on what flavor they are. Uh, and there isn't any sense, um, th there's no sense at all, I think, of the, of the spiritual dynamic that's involved in being part of a, a wider church. Roman Catholics are Roman Catholics because they really do believe they are the, the true Western church. Baptists are Baptists because they don't get the sacramentalism and they, they, they love the New Testament and they just want to apply it in a fairly straightforward um, way. And they are conviction Christians. But there are very few Anglicans in the Church of England. Very few is not the right word. It, it, it's it's um, uh, There is no culture of being a conviction Christian in the Church of England. I remember when I went to my, uh, my diocesan director of ordinance when I thought I had a vocation. And I said, um, I've been converted at a university mission. I want to serve Jesus and build the kingdom and the church. And he said, well, don't, don't forget that you were baptized and sung in a church choir from the age of six. I do recommend you go light on this conversion stuff. <laughs> and, uh, you'll put people off wanting to make you a priest in the Church of England. Well, Dan, so, that, that, that is, that's not entirely confined to England. Uh, one of our viewers nominated me to be bishop of a diocese of the Episcopal Church out west. And I thought, well, why not? And uh, I went through the initial process and I talked to the first committee and what they came away with was, well, you're not, you're a little too Christian uh, <laughs> to be a bishop of the Episcopal Church. In other words, exactly this issue of conviction. They wanted an administrator, they wanted somebody who wouldn't upset other people who would go along to get along, and I was a little too, I believed a little too much and I took it too seriously. So we have that too in the Episcopal Church. Well, must, I'm sure it's wider than, than, than England, but it's particularly pronounced in England. And as a result, people don't really much care about what's beyond their parish. But, but if we move to what, the, what that means now, in, in a sense, again, it's not unlike um, being English in the 1930s when trouble was brewing in Europe with, with, with fascism and Nazism. Uh, if, if things were working in the local pub, why would you care on this island? where we don't have to care very much. But what's going on now is that, is that Ian Paul has just released a, a letter where there are over 2,000 signatories to the House of Bishops saying, we think you've handled baptism wrong, we think you've handled the issue of transgenderism badly, and we'd like you to think again. Now, in one sense, this is very exciting and, and a, a show of conviction Christianity. <laughs> the problem is that and, and Ian, Ian knows this better than anybody else. The letter comes with no sanctions. So if the House of Bishops decides it's not going to do anything, or if the reality is, which is that the general synod power uh, structure is in the hands of progressives, they will continue to mandate the House of Bishops to go on doing progressive, uh, unethical, unchristian things. And, and nobody can stop them. And just writing a letter with 2,000 signatures isn't going to make any difference. So there will come a point where I think the 2,000 signatories say, uh, we are now so uncomfortable in the Church of England, that we want to do more than write a letter. And at that point, they really won't know what to do. But Gavin, let, uh, let me push, push a tiny bit pushback, because I actually agree with where you're going, but I think our viewers need to have a, a, a better sense. So you are you advising Ian Paul and company not to have even bothered? I mean, isn't it no. good? that there's an attempt to state the eternal ver verities of the faith. Shouldn't we celebrate that work? I'm a great fan of Ian Paul. I think he, he brings so much to the table, including the passion of conviction Christianity, though he and I diverge over some, some, some issues, which is always fun. No, I think it's wonderful he's done it. But I'm afraid I think that Ian and many others, uh, they're, they're, like, they're like I was, they, they, they're doing church politics like I played chess when I was nine. I remember my father trying to get me to think, boy, you need to go two moves ahead or three or four or five. And I had quite a lot of trouble not just responding to the move that was ahead of me um, as, as a nine-year-old chess player. I, I don't think they've thought through what's going to happen. Uh, the, we are engaged in a life or death struggle spiritually with the culture of the age. And it's taking place in an Erastian organization that is married to the spirit of the age and the state. And therefore, if you're a conviction Christian, 
there will come a point, just like the Reformation, where there will be a tearing apart. They haven't given any thought to that. They can't see it coming, but it's an absolute necessity unless they give way and give up their convictions because the spirit of the age is not going to change. Well, Kevin, Kevin has uh, criticized me on this point, and it's a fair criticism, but in the Episcopal Church, we had that moment of, yeah. you know, but in Florida, we've not had that moment. We've not had our, we've not, the spirit of the age hasn't made its way down to the forests and swamps down here. So I'm happy being an Episcopal and we have a healthy diocese. Things are wonderful. It's just those people up north. So in some, some aspects, I have a great deal of sympathy for the <laughs> country clergy who say, well, our parish is doing fine. Thank you very much. I don't want to involve, I don't want to upset people by involving them in issues that we can't do anything about. Okay, so I'm, I'm, afraid... I'm open to that criticism, but I well, understand are... it well. No, you are indeed open to it. And, and, it, and uh, without making it personal, it's a very good example of the way in which being Anglican allows you simply to be a, an insular congregationalist. Um, it, the, both the Baptists and the Catholics have a better sense of what it is to be church. The Catholics do it because they understand church, and the Baptists do it because they understand the kingdom. Anglicans have a propensity when push comes to shove to lower their heads and say, if my community is okay, I'm not worried. It's, it's fine. But, and, and, and in one sense, you can see why you don't need to involve the, the little old ladies as prayer warriors in the cosmic conflict. But at another stage, well, you do. Well, let's well, know, in, I, I wanna... in, in a tiny bit of defense, uh, <laughs> the, what, we've done, what we're doing is no different than what our forebears did in uh, the Episcopal Church during the Civil War, the Baptist split, the Methodist split, the Presbyterian split, everybody split. What did the Episcopal Church do? Waited till the war was over to decide <laughs> this moral issue. So we, during the Civil War, we had, a, we had Episcopalians on both sides, very famous, very prominent. We decided not to decide. And I have to be perfectly frank that there is a temptation uh, when we're talking about institutional things, which frankly I'm not that interested in, not to decide and focus on the immediate spiritual things in front of me. And that's a, I, I'm, I'll be the first to admit that is a justified failing, but I can only well, do I, I can do it. In England, I think it's, it would, the, the Puritans and the Catholics would be entitled to say to the Anglicans, you're not conviction Christians, because if you were, you would have joined one of us. <laughs> and by not joining one of us, uh, you're, you're practicing a kind of religion of convenience. Well, of course, that had, you know, we're not looking for trouble. We don't want to make martyrs of ourselves. But there do come moments uh, in the life of, of, a, of a culture and a country and a church and sometimes in a private life, when, you know, when your own witness is compromised, when, when you have to make a really quite serious decision. And although I don't like that kind of discomfort, I'm afraid culturally and historically, I think we're in one of those periods of history. I think where it's important now to jump is, okay, we are at a crossroads, or at least the Church of England is at a crossroads. Gavin has made his decision and he has stood by it and he suffered the consequences of it. Um, where do I jump? Where does my parish jump? I, you know, what happens? You know, the uh, GAFCON UK has just announced that its uh, leader is going on a four month or six month sabbatical. Uh, or we're basically being, t okay, Gavin, we're ready to go. This letter speaks to what we want to do. What do I do now? And what I understand is that GAFCON UK is basically saying, well, end of next summer, we'll, we'll let you know. Well, uh, I want to cool. I want to back in here. Certainly, Ian Paul. We talked about Archbishop Foley and his uh, confusion over nobody knowing about uh, the ACNA, GAFCON, and GAFCON UK in the UK. Ian Paul knows about GAFCON UK. Uh, certainly, a majority of the people, two thousand people who signed this letter, know about it. Um, do they know there may or may not be an alternative? I don't think people in the Church of England want to know there's an alternative because the price of knowing is the price of losing your house, your pension, your public status, your plan of life. It's, it's, a, it's a very serious price indeed to ask people. I have to say I'm quite lucky. Uh, 
I, I, I got to near the end of my life. Um, and and uh, I wasn't giving up that much ambition because, uh, f because I wasn't. <laughs> so um, I think, so let's go back to GAFCON UK. This is slightly embarrassing because um, I can't help but be critical of GAFCON UK at this point. I think, as George was saying, the implications are that if you read the signs of the times and the particular point in the cycle that we're at of crisis and reform, the whole point about GAFCON UK is that this is the moment when it should be offering a solution and a different way of doing things. And also pastoral care. Pa pastoral care and prophecy are the two things that it should be doing. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry that Andy Limes has gone away on a sabbatical, but the consequences of that is that they're not doing either. Can, Kevin, can you, give, uh, could you give uh, could you give sort of the factual update so we, people are on the same page as to what we're saying? What has happened with GAFCON UK? Well, I'll I'll do it then. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, get to, George, if you could tell them quickly what Andy Lyons. We got a letter last week. Give it, give an update on that. Two things have happened. One. GAFCON UK, when it was formed, put together as a panel of reference or advisors. Gavin, what was it called? Uh, uh, yes, it was a pa panel of reference. I, I was on it. Yeah. They put together a panel of reference of uh, Anglo Catholics, evangelicals, leaders in the in the movement to reform and renew the Church of England to bring it out of its thyrotyra like state. Uh, last week, this panel was resolved basically. Dissolved, the letter was sent by Andy Lyons, the head of GAFCON UK, Bishop Lyons, saying, uh, Lyons, that uh, we don't need you anymore. Uh, time has come where I can take full charge. Then the following few days, a letter was released by Andy Lyons saying, um, I'm going to be taking a long term leave of absence and uh, will be in Australia for a few months. And I followed up with a letter to the ACNA uh, office because Gaf ACNA and, and GAFCON basically been overseeing GAFCON UK and their response was, well, Andy Lyons will be out, but we have uh, three people, uh, Susie Leaf, Michael Nazarali, and Andrew Symes answering the phones while he's gone. Ah, we have West Hill Community Church in, is it Aberdeen, I think it is, and the Scottish Episcopal Church is crumbling as we speak. People are ready to jump, come back in six months. Uh, is that well, what said? There's a parish on the Isle of Wight that has just woken up to the fact uh, that its archdeacon has his live-in lover or his husband, I forget which it is, uh, moving onto the island. Uh, they, they, they might have known before because he's a canon of, of the where Portsmouth Cathedral and a member of General Synod, but, but they didn't know. We're, we're back to the insularism that's part of our church. Now, anyway, now he's been appointed as archdeacon of the Isle of Wight. They're outraged. And they're deeply upset and they're spiritually perturbed and they're asking questions saying we don't think we can go on as we are what do we do where do we go um this and at this exact moment when were i giving them advice and i'm going to do it now now as we do a charm offensive now is when you reach out a pub people 2000 people have put their careers or their necks or their reputations on the line by signing a letter uh, saying that they think the Church of England has made a major mistake. Now is the time to start the charm offensive, to say, here's what we can offer. Here's where we can help you. In other words, you can still keep your vicarage. You can still be within the Church of England, but we are here to help you with pastoral, spiritual, emotional uh, support and oversight. And what do we have instead? We've got people answering the phones until someone's back in the office. I we're, think all, we're all speechless. <laughs> it's just like, you know, what do you say? I mean, we're a little speechless. We obviously support GAFCA and we obviously support the uh, ACNA, but unless there's something happening that we aren't seeing or we're not hearing about, uh, this let, is let a, say, a colossal. Yes? I, well, I'd like to say a word of support for Andy Lyons, really. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I can see how the conversation can go in one of two directions. Let, let me take it in one of them rather than the other. Um, Andy Lyons has been given responsibilities that, that are really quite enormous. Uh, and I'm afraid the fault lies in those who appointed him and, and asked him 
and gave him gave him tasks that actually are unreasonably difficult and exponentially unending um, simply to have simply to have found somebody and said we're now going to appoint you our bishop uh, and, and here you go and here's two tasks no three no four no five no well six seven eight nine ten and they grow exponentially no you you the, you know you do not you don't have a suffragan there isn't a, a, a a, a team taking responsibility for you, caring for you, looking after you. Um, I, 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 I mean, I partly feel this because at one stage I was headhunted uh, to uh, uh, to be considered to, to run the House of Bishops for the Church of England. And so how you take care of bishops was something I'd given a lot of thought to. Uh, and I felt very sorry for Andy that he was plucked out and given this role. It seems to me without any proper thinking of it through. So the project, the the... The architects of the project, I think, need to revisit why they appointed Andy, what they want him to do, and now that they discovered the wheels have fallen off, how they can greatly improve the project. Because the project is very, very important indeed. When, when the fabric tears, uh, when the 2000 letter writers discover that they are uh, engaged in a church that is not going to pay any attention in any real sense to their desire to be orthodox christians some people are going to have to make a decision and the whole point of gafcon is to provide a conviction anglicanism that those who put their discipleship to jesus beyond their cultural religious instincts can make a choice and they're letting them down by allowing the present situation to continue i remember a conversation i had with gerald bray and this is this is my wake-up moment uh, I was doing an interview, and he was confused about my excitement for Anglicanism. He goes, you know, Kevin, in the Church of England, the average citizen thinks not of the Anglican Church as something great and glorious. It's the public library. It's where you go for your weddings, your baptisms, and your funerals. Well, what do you mean? I thought it was a, a, a glorious liturgical conviction church where uh, that's alive and going places. And you're like, nope. And well, how, how do you take these 2,000 people who sign this letter that are disgusted with the Church of England and make them care enough to see some, that there's an alternative out there? Part of the problem is that one of the things we've done over the last 30 years since the ordination of women to, to the priesthood is that the people who were conviction Anglicans, who, who were Anglo-Catholic sacramentalists uh, and evangelicals who took the mystical insights of St. Paul into sexuality seriously, many of them have gone. They've left the Church of England. Uh, they, they've left it to people whose convictions are, are, are more about their own relationship with spirituality than they are about the kingdom of heaven. And so in, in, in the end, you'll, you, you, you find you've left, if you lose the people of passion and conviction, what are you left with? Uh, the people who signed the letter are still people of conviction. Uh, I, I hope they're people of passion too, but they're going to find they have to make a choice at some point. Well, just, just to push back a bit, uh, I think that the hurdle that uh, GAFCON UK and the ACNA has to overcome is why don't people like me immediately sign up? Well, because I, in essence, have left the General Convention Episcopal Church. Yet, there are, there's no penalty for me. There's no downside. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, where I am, um, I'm in a post-denominational part of the country, a post-denominational era. The majority of my people are not Episcopalians. They're Catholics, they're Baptists, they're Lutheran. We have some people who are Methodists for six months in Chicago and Episcopalian six months down here. Because we are a conviction church, and that conviction is Jesus Christ and uh, how we are as a congregation. But there is no value added to my being part of the Episcopal Church, so there can be no value lost by mm. not being part of the Episcopal Church. There's no value added of my joining the ACNA. There's no value lost of my not being there. I have a prayer book. I have spiritual oversight by people who I regard as spiritual leaders. And then I have a bishop in Orlando. Uh, and so for the, 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 the task 
is to basically say to people like me in England, in the United States, in Canada, in Australia, New Zealand, who are conviction Christians, who are in a living, live, successful, not we're not the vicars of Bray, that no matter who's in charge, we remain the vicars of Bray, but uh, how, how do you respond to our needs? I think, I think this is a historical problem, and I'm afraid I think it goes back to the Reformation. Um, I've always thought the whole point of the Reformation was to reform the church. Uh, it was a spiritual movement to bring new life to the church and to set it right where it had gone wrong. My understanding of the Reformation is that by, by becoming an, an end in itself instead of a means to an end, it diminishes what the church ought to be. And it, and it allows exactly what you've described, George, small splinter groups of Christians to bed down in communities uh, alone by themselves. I remember David Watson saying in one of his images that the whole point of being a Christian was you were like a coal and you had to be in the fire or you would go out. If you remove a coal from the fire, the danger is it goes out. And I think that's probably true on a broader scale, which is one of the reasons why I have a Catholic ecclesiology. Uh, you know, if if Ignatius uh, hadn't hadn't been part of a wider church, who who would he have written to when he went when he went to Rome? Why why did he bother to write to any other Christians? He he could just have been a Christian where he was. But from the beginning, there has been a sense that to be part of the church was to be linked to Christians everywhere. And as it happened, it, it took place through episcopate and the martyrdom. I think if you remove that, you're, you're in danger of allowing isolated Christian communities and a kind of isolated personalist Christian humanity that can't meet the challenge and, ra and raise itself to the game when, when things change. But the, Gavin, the, the difficulty there, and I don't dispute what you say, but the difficulty is that you're asking someone like me to adopt a new ecclesiology, a new culture. Yes. Yes, you're asking, right. you're asking me to, in other words, when I hear the language you use, being coal burning in the fires, I look, and the fires that we are in as I look around, you know, work with the homeless, uh, supporting uh, disabled and cognitively uh, challenged people, uh, unwed mothers, uh, you know, so on and so on and so on. We are certainly in those fires, but the fire we're not in is why should I care about general convention? Because it doesn't care about me. So to, to, do, to, to make that leap, I need to have an ecclesiological conversion that, uh, that being part of the church is more than just being, uh, having, if you will, the local franchise. Or George, I, I, I don't want to be provoked into, into, uh, into exposing uh, how my ecclesiological sympathies are developing. But, but I, I've always been very impressed that, uh, it, that the Roman Catholics are members of a community that's two billion strong. And that when they take a stand against abortion, against sexual ethics, they do it as, as a coherent community. When, when, when people outside the Roman Catholic community take a stand, you, you don't hear quite so much of it. It's more of an individual conscience matter. That doesn't make it any less valuable. But, but if you're going to sacrifice being a membership, being a member of something two, two billion strong, you need to have some very good reasons to do it. There's going to be a big upside to it. And one of the things that has driving my developing sense of ecclesiology is that what might have been important in, in, uh, in, in 1540 or 1620 in terms of the way you took on a corrupt system may not be the key to, to producing a flourishing worldwide Christian community in the 21st century. One of the groups that I studied uh, and have been studying, because this is an issue that I'm conflicted over. Uh, it's mm. not that I'm thoroughly sold on my own beliefs, but it's one that I have been studying and I've been involved in this fight for 25 years, looking at the Confessing Church in Germany. I'm very much with you there. And looking at the Confessing Church, and then looking at those people who did not join the Confessing Church, and one of the things that they would say, not out loud so that the Nazis would hear, but rather, we need to keep our doors open because we are hiding Jews. We are keeping our, we, by keeping our head down, we're keeping the flame alive. You have a different charism, which is the fight, the good fight on a higher level. We have the charism in our little village of maintaining what is right and true and good and working with the people next to me who I can touch and see so that we are hiding Jews. We are uh, not informing on this trade unionists. We are basically nodding our heads to the laws and then going and doing and being 
if you will, we're following the pietistic tradition of the state is just of no consequence. The gospel is everything. So how and, do you tie these two things together? I think I think because you're uh, right, and I agree with you. Where where I, I'm coming from is that it, there's a conceit in my heart, and uh, it is a conceit is that we are an oasis in a broken world. And just because some nut or lunatic at general convention does or says something that, why should I shut my doors to the methamphetamine addict uh, who needs a hand now, who I can help? Because if I do choose to invest all my money in legal fights over something of inconsequential as property or my pension or my status, when I'm actually called to serve the person in need at my knees in front of me. That's, that's a hard thing for me to say. It's more important for me to be right than it is to be helping. Well, I think I one of the, one that's, of the things not a, that's not a developed theologically profound point of view, but it's where I am as a person right now. I, I don't want to miss the, the, the recent history. The recent history is anybody who put their hands up under the leadership of presiding uh, Bishop Catherine Jefferts Shorey was shot. Uh, I moved. put my hand up, Kevin, every week. Yeah, you I, did. But no, uh, uh, see, uh, see, I, I, um, there are. Well, there were a few people who chose martyrdom and went out of their way to do it. Mm -hmm. I've had my hand up since the the time of Ed Browning. <laughs> okay, I have there. I have been blackballed by in my search for employment over 25 years, I think there are only three or four dioceses that would employ me. And, you know, uh, were, I, were some freakish occurrence to happen and were I elected bishop somewhere, I would not receive ratifications or no consent. Uh, George, I just my love hands it. up. I, I love it that you're saying, here I am, make me a martyr, and they won't do it. <laughs> they won't do it. I think, Indeed. let me put things together. They, 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 won't, they won't give me fancy titles, and I won't be able to get dressed up, but I can still preach the gospel and help save souls and bring them to Jesus Christ. And they're not, they can't do anything about that. So I think what draws our two narratives together is the is conviction Christianity. What we all of us are required to be faithful to our vocation, to say to our Lord, Lord, what are you asking of me in my situation? Help me do it. And the Gafcon thing, if I can bring it back to, um, the criticism is that some people are going to be willing to be martyrs. Others are not willing to be martyrs. Some will want to be martyrs, and that's not their vocation, like George. But <coughs> It, there should there should be some facilitation of vocation. It, we we should be able to be church in some of the different ways the Holy Spirit's calling us to do it. I think our complaint about what's going on in England at the moment is that the the the, the facilitation of allowing conviction Christianity beyond the status quo, which is sinking deeper into a secularist mire, uh, doesn't seem to be there, and it ought to be there. And I want to agree that you know we're not just protecting the brand. Certainly the Episcopal Church as a brand or franchise shot. Church of England as a brand franchise shot. Roman Catholic Church is, you know, getting to the place where it, it's completely shot as a brand. It's more than that. It's you it, it is the working of a communion, working with, you know, all that it comes with, the liturgy, um, the saints, the history, the tradition, um, and the community, the communion. It's more than just protecting the brand. All right, we've had about 45 yeah, minutes. No, no, well, just to be, what? Kevin, if I were interested in the brand, I would have, I would have stayed on Wall Street. Uh, <laughs> why? I mean, I would have chosen... A, well, that's why I'm what, saying that this what, is, what is, what this is, is more than protecting in, the brand. Yeah, but what is happening in the world today is that the brands are meaningless. Meaningless. Um, I've, I think that uh, Pope uh, Benedict is one of the greatest spiritual thinkers of my lifetime. And I looked to him, looked to him for th on issues that were of moral and spiritual and emotional and physical concern. He's a Catholic. He's a very Catholic Catholic. <laughs> my goodness, why would I, you know... How can I beat up Justin Welby for saying it's fine to be a Catholic when I think Cardinal, you know, Joseph Ratzinger is one of the great men of the 21st century? 
Because you think it for different reasons, George. You, you think it because you've thought it through and you know what your value system is. Justin Welby hasn't thought it through and doesn't have a value system. That's the difference. The fact that you end up by saying the same thing uh, doesn't make them of equivalent value. But I say it in English, he says it in German. But yeah. <laughs> uh, let me so go I back. Feel his ideas, no one will know. I want to go back to Benedict because I think this is really important. Um, one of the things that Benedict has said, and, and no one asks why he said it, is that he sees a Christianity and a Roman Catholicism uh, in, uh, around the world that is very much diminished, going back to core groups. Now, one of the ways in which Christianity survived some persecutions is through the kind of ecclesial structure that Catholicism embodies. And, 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 and for one and a half thousand years was the only way of being the Orthodox Christian Church. My concern is that if we're going to find ourselves in a situation where we are involved in a car crash with, a, with an aggressive secular culture that hates Christianity, um, it's important that the coal stays part of the fire, that you, that kind of ecclesiology works. And one of the reasons why I'm more and more attracted to it, uh, and Anglicanism has it, it contains it, that, that it, it's, it's what we are. We have a Catholic ecclesiology, uh, it's, it, which, which, you know, the early centuries, the marks of the church were the, the resurrection, the Eucharist, the bishop witnessing a martyrdom. That was what made the church, but you had to be tied together. Uh, and I, I, don't, I think being isolated pockets of Christians outside that structure is going to be counterproductive if we find ourselves involved in a very serious struggle with with the powers as they come against us that's one of the reasons why uh, I, I too am a favor a fan of benedict and i think we should listen to what he says as both pope benedict and the benedict option warn us that we're entering a fresh stage of of, of christianity uh i want to continue this point because i think it is very it's vital I'll put it this way. Uh, this past weekend, I went up to Philadelphia to bury Susan's stepfather. And Susan's, up, my wife, uh, is still up there, but I had flew up Friday night, came back Saturday night because of my services. And, and I wore my collar on the flight because I didn't change from work or change after the funeral. And sitting in the waiting lounge of the Philadelphia airport, a number of people came up to me and said, Father, are you a priest? And I said, yes, but I'm an Episcopal priest. And they sat down anyway. And they <laughs> spoke to me about a stranger uh, doing his very best to be not noticed because he was exhausted. But people coming forward with deep non-denominational issues. Yeah. But a burning desire. Some kid with more metal in his nose and eyebrows than I have on the, on the hood of my car wanting to talk about the profound things of life. Is, li is God real? Is life real? Why is there pain in this world? An older man saying, should I still be a Catholic with all this abuse stuff? And people, there's such a hunger that is not met by this spiritual, secular, material, Marxist world that only Christ can provide. That if we, as I say, Gavin, go up into the mountains and hide away and wait for it to all blow over. We're not doing our jobs. I agree. I agree, I agree entirely. And the bell is tolling, Gavin. Who is the bell tolling for? <laughs> well, it's kind of cool that we have those bells available for those who did dine off over the last couple of minutes. We're here to help. The <laughs> whoa, whoa, what's going on? You know, we provide many services here at Unscripted, not just great discussion, not just the news, not just analysis, but a bell that tolls for you to wake up at the end of the episode. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and as Kevin has shown on the screen, we're listening, you are listening <laughs> to 481. Thank you for your well, patience. I, I forgot to put this up. Do you see that? I had that available. I didn't put that up, and I didn't put this up. Uh, there's another thing I had available. Uh, you know, I'm just not a good tech guy like I thought. Uh, and that's you're the theologians. I'm I'm clearly just the sex symbol oh, for the I'm show. Not, I'm not a theologian. <laughs> I'm not a sex symbol. I make we, are, <laughs> we are the body of Christ. We all need each other and each other's gifts. <laughs> Amen. God bless you.